Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video and the next few videos, I'm going to break it up into several, we're going to be discussing the deep muscles of the back and the spine. Okay. So a lot of these muscles are going to be important for stabilization of the spine, which would be important during a deadlift like this. And then also if we're performing back rotations, extensions, things like that. Okay. When we talk about the muscles of the back and the spine, we have three layers. The superficial and intermediate layers, which we discussed in previous videos, uh, those are not true back muscles. They're called back muscles because they exist on the back. That's where they're physically located, but they don't control movements of the back. So in the superficial layer, we have the latissimus dorsi, we have the trapezius, we have the rhomboids, major and minor, and then the levator scapulae. And of course, none of those actually control movement of the back. For instance, the latissimus dorsi is an adductor and extensor of the shoulder joint, but it doesn't move the back. And the other ones that I mentioned there, they're actually responsible for movements of the scapula. So they're not actually moving the spine, so they're not true back muscles. The same thing goes for the muscles in the intermediate layer. Those are not true back muscles, even though they exist on the back. And those are going to be your uh, serratus posterior, superior, and inferior. They only control movements of the ribs. And we talked about that uh, in the last video. Now we're going to look at the deep muscles of the back and the spine. And these are the true uh, back muscles because they perform movements or actions on the back and the spine. And the major movements we're going to see here are back extension. We'll see a little bit of lateral flexion and then also rotation type of movements. Okay. And like I said, we're going to break this up into several videos. Okay, so when we're looking at the deep layer, within the deep layer, uh, there are actually three sub-layers, okay? This is actually the superficial layer of the deep layer, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. And the superficial layer of the deep layer is composed of what we call the splenius muscles, and there's two here. We have the splenius capitis and the splenius cervicus. Before we go any further, I want to make this perfectly clear. Whenever you see the term capitis, cap like on the head, like you wear a cap on your head, right? Capitus means that that muscle inserts somewhere on the skull, okay? If you see the term capitus, that's what it means. There's only one exception, which we'll talk about in a later video. But in this video and the next, that's what it means. Capitus inserts on the skull. Um, cervicus would not insert on the skull, but it would be in the cervical region, okay? So this top muscle right here, which is actually a little bit larger than the other one, uh, this would be the right splenius capitus. Now, the splenius capitis um, is going to insert on the skull, specifically on the mastoid processes on each side, and then the temporal and occipital bone. And actually, the mastoid processes are part of the temporal bone, but it's also going to insert on the occiput. Okay? And you can actually see that insertion right here. It's kind of going a little bit around the lateral side of the skull. So this is your splenius capitis. And it's going to originate on the vertebral column. And specifically, it's going to originate on what's called the nuchal ligament, also called ligamentum nuchae, and the spinous processes of C7 to T3. Now, uh, what does this mean, nuchal ligament? Well, to understand this, let's actually go and take a look at this slide right here. Here's a lateral view of the skull and the vertebral column. We see this large ligament right here that seems to come down from the external occipital protuberance and it goes along the base of the occiput right here and seems to connect the spinous processes of really C1 down to C7. Of course, we know C1 doesn't have a spinous process. It's called the posterior tubercle. But for our purposes here, just it's the spinous processes down to C7. This large sheet-like ligament, this is the nuchal ligament, also called ligamentum nuchae, which is what it's labeled right here. Notice as we go down to C7, which is actually right here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Below C7, uh, the nuchal ligament is replaced by the supraspinous ligament. So when we talked about the supraspinous ligament, remember that that only existed at the uh, right below the spinous process of C7 and downward. Above C7, so on the top of C7 and above, it exists as the nuchal ligament. But in any case, the nuchal ligament is really just a broader extension of the supraspinous ligament. So that's what we mean. Okay. So splenius capitis originates on the nuchal ligament, which would kind of be right here. And then it's also going to originate on the spinous processes from C7, which is where the nuchal ligament terminates, down to T3. And of course, it's going to insert 
on the mastoid process and the occiput. And then inferior to the splenius capitis, we have the splenius cervicus. The splenius cervicus is, is inferior, and so it's not going to insert on the occiput. So therefore, it does not bear the name capitis. Uh, the splenius cervicus is going to originate right where the splenius capitis leaves off. It's going to originate on the spinous processes of T3 down to T6. And then it's going to insert on the transverse processes of C1 to C3. Remember, C1 is the atlas, C2 is the axis, and then C3 is, well, just C3. It's going to insert on the transverse processes of those vertebrae. And you can't really see those um, insertions right here, but notice that from the spinous processes, it appears that this muscle is moving laterally. And laterally is where we would have the transverse processes. So make some reason to it, and it'll make much more sense and help you remember it. Um, when we're looking at these two muscles, they both have a similar innervations. Uh, it's going to be dorsal rami that are at that particular level, um, but also middle cervical nerves for the splenius capitis, and then lower cervical nerves for the splenius cervicus, which makes sense. It would be lower for the cervicus because it's the inferior muscle, whereas for the splenius capitis, it's above that, so it would be the middle cervical nerves along with the dorsal rami. Okay? And the actions for these are pretty much the same. They're going to be involved in neck extension, okay? also called cervical extension. And that's if they're both contracting at the same time. So if I have both the right and left, splenius capitis and splenius cervicus, I'm going to get neck extension, which would basically be, if you're standing up right now, or sitting for that matter, if you basically uh, move your head upward to look at the ceiling, that would be a neck extension. If one side of these contracts, let's say the right splenius capitis and the right splenius cervicus, if they contract, but not the left side, then I would have neck rotation to the right, which would be an ipsilateral or same side neck rotation. Vice versa, if the left splenius capitis and left splenius cervicus contracted, I would have rotation of the neck to the left. So that's ipsilateral. Now, sometimes in the gym, you might actually see somebody doing this. Um, usually, they don't carry these. You'd have to actually buy one. I've actually used one of these in the past before. And um, what this guy has is this uh, little helmet-like thing around his skull, and then it's able to dangle a circular weight down here. And what he's ultimately going to do is kind of move his head back in this direction, which would be a neck extension. And so this is probably the best exercise if you're looking to strengthen uh, these two muscles in your neck. So you're actually having a resisted neck extension, so for strength, hypertrophy, or even just endurance. But this would be a workout for those neck muscles. Okay? And because it's a true neck extension and not a rotation, it would be working both left and right at the same time. Okay? We're going to move to the layer deep to the splenius. Now, we're still in overall the deep layer. Remember, the splenius muscles were the superficial layer of the deep layer. Now we're going to move to the intermediate layer of the deep layer. Okay? So these are deep to the splenius. These are what we call the erector spiny group. Okay? The erector spiny group are a group of three muscles that all are back extensors. And these collectively are the most powerful back extensors we have. If you go to the gym and work the Roman chair, if you don't know what that is, I'll look it up, or the back extension machine, these are the muscles you're working. Okay, the erector spiny group, okay, if you actually look at the very base here, it's not super visible, but they're all going to have a common origin. Okay, um, they may have some other origins, but at least at the bottom, they all have a common origin. And this is what we call the common aponeurosis of the erector spiny, or the common erector spiny aponeurosis. And so they're all going to originate on that, at least at the bottom. Okay. Um, like I mentioned, all of these muscles, the three within the erector spiny group, are going to be powerful back extensors. Um, but if one side of them contracts, you're going to have lateral flexion of the spine. If both of them contract at the same time, you're going to have back extension or spinal extension. So let's actually look at each one of these individually. And we're going to start with the most lateral. So one thing you need to associate with the erector spiny group is you need to know which one is lateral, in the middle, and medial. The lateral one is the iliocostales. Okay? Now the iliocostales are going to have an origin at the sacrum, iliac crest, 
spinous processes of the lower lumbar and thoracic vertebrae. Um, and the reason that the origin is so complicated here is we actually have three separate regions of the iliocostales. There's a lumborum region in the lumbar spine, a thoracic region in the thoracic spine, and a cervicus region in the cervical spine. Okay? So that's why the origin is very complicated, and we could even throw in there, down at the very bottom, which isn't visible here, it also has an origin at the common erector spinae aponeurosis. Now the important thing about the iliocostales is that its insertion is on the ribs. Okay? Um, you can't really see the ribs too well here, but if you were given a question where you had to identify the iliocostales, you would just look for the ones that insert on the ribs and that would tell you you're dealing with iliocostales. Also, it's in the name. Part of it is costales. Remember, costal means rib, okay? Ilio means ilium, and notice the origin is on the iliac crest, at least part of it, ilio, and then inserts on the ribs, costales. And also, these are the most uh, lateral of all of them. All right, in the middle, we have the longissimus. Now, the longissimus is also divided into three regions, but it's a little bit different. Logismus does not have a lumborum region. It starts at thoracis, then we go up to cervicus, and then capitis. There's actually a region of the logismus that attaches to the occiput. Remember, capitis implies that it attaches to the skull. Now, with the logismus, its origins are going to be on transverse processes, okay? And then the insertions are going to be on transverse processes above. Now, again, these numbers are going to be a little bit different depending on what source you're looking at. But we could, for instance, have a longissimus piece, a piece of it, let's say, that originates on the T5 transverse process, but then it ends up inserting on the C4 transverse process. So these are actually going to span up quite a few levels before they actually insert. Uh, but the point is, is all the longissimus pieces are going to insert on transverse processes above. The only exception is going to be the capitis region, which of course is going to insert on the occiput, okay, or the skull in general. But associate, generally speaking, longissimus with inserting on transverse processes above, all right? Now let's go to the, the medial part of the erector spinae muscle group. This is the spinalis. Now the spinalis um, this part is actually most prominent in the thoracic region of the spine. Um, there is a cervicus region of this, but it's not really visible here, and it's not very pronounced. The most pronounced region of the spinalis is in the thoracic region, which is why it's labeled like this. And generally speaking, the spinalis are going to originate on spinous processes. Okay? So in the thoracic region, it would originate on the spinous process of the upper lumbar and lower thoracic vertebrae. You can kind of see that right here. And then it would insert on the spinous processes of upper thoracic vertebrae, which lie above. So the origin is below and the insertion is above. And in case you didn't notice, that was actually true for all three of these erector spiny muscles. The origins are below, the insertions are above. All right? Then, if we look at the spinales again, there's also a cervicus region, although it's not very prominent, but it originates on the nuchal ligament and the spinous process of C7, and then it inserts above that on the spinous process of the cervical vertebrae, except for the atlas. And why wouldn't it insert on the spinous process of the atlas? Atlas doesn't have a spinous process. It has a posterior tubercle. Okay? But the point is, is that the spinales are the medial part of the erector spinae muscle group. The other thing that can help you remember where the origins and insertions are for the spinalis is that it's in the name, spine. They originate and insert on spinous processes, thus spinalis, okay? Kind of the same thing with iliocostales. It tells you where it originates and where it inserts. The only exception is longissimus. You kind of just have to learn that, okay? Now, when we're talking about the erector spiny muscle group, uh, generally speaking, they all have the same innervation and that's by the dorsal rami of the spinal nerve at that level. Now these muscles exist all the way up the spine. So depending on where you are on the spine, it's gonna be a different dorsal ramus. So for example, if you are in the uh, cervical region, I would expect it to be a cervical dorsal ramus. If you're in the lumbar region, it's gonna be a lumbar dorsal ramus. So it just depends on where you are in the spine. And so it's segmentally innervated uh, by different dorsal rami of the spinal nerves, all right? And then for the action of these muscles, they're all going to have the same action uh, like we talked about. This group is a spinal erector, meaning it's going to allow you to stand upright, okay? So back extension, 
okay? And that's if both sides are contracting at the same time, would give you back extension. If only one side was contracting, you'd have lateral flexion. So let's say the right erector spiny muscles are contracting, then you'd have uh, lateral flexion to the right. If the left one's contracted, then you'd have left lateral flexion of the spine, okay? So hopefully this gave you a good understanding of the erector spiny muscle group and then also the splenius muscles. In the next video, we're going to switch gears and go to the deepest of these muscles, and we're going to start there with the transversospinalis muscles. All right? Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.